Uh, oh, I should say, go back one, one slide. I should just make a comment. That, um, that picture is um, of a t a a at the base of a mountain of a temple of Tagoji, whose uh, Gojin Tarada's uh, temple. Um, if, for those who have been here a while, Gojin Tarada was uh, one of the first temple assistants. Um, and at the base of the, he he he's now, um, if not already or soon to be, the abbot of his temple. Um, at the bottom, there, uh, you, as you walk up this long path up to the temple, um, this starts off your path, and you have to walk between the two nyo, and these are guardian deities. And it's just uh, in talking about in, in our discussion, I'll try to elucidate why I feel. It, it, it just evokes something as you try to walk between them on the starting up this path. So I thought I'd include that here. But, um, but this evening, the discussion is um, um, going to be about um, Jizo Bosat. Um, this is uh, Garba. Um, and uh, it's uh, an image, uh, a figure in um, uh, used a lot in Japan, seen a lot in Japan. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and one that I feel particularly strongly connected to. Um, and, uh, and so when Sensei asked me, hey, what, what should we do? Um, I wanted to spend some time talking about Jiso. Um, I, I like these conversations um, about particular figures. Um, a couple of months ago, Sensei did one on Yachin Yorai, the Medicine Buddha. Um, and, and, uh, and I hope to kind of elucidate why I like talking about these, the figures. We don't always kind of dive in deep because it's such a vast cosmology. Um, but this particular image um, uh, figure spoke to me from an early time in my Buddhist path, if not the earliest. Um, and so this is one of the first that I came in contact with. And it was probably, if not this image, something very close to this. Um, and it, it, it invoked something in me. And so again, I'll, I'll kind of uh, uh, fill that out as we go on here. But um, so tonight we'll be discussing a little bit about uh, who Jizo Bosatsa is um, and what the, the figure represents, um, why that is, um, and then and kind of how, if, how the figure has evolved um, over time. Um, and so we don't hear much about um, Jizo until about the seventh century, which is when we have our kind of first recorded um, documentation still intact. Um, and it's a Chinese, in Chinese, a sutra, the Kitsugaba Sutra. Um, and uh, so we don't have an original text. We don't have it in Sanskrit. You can take that as you will. It might be one of those that was kind of attributed to Sanskrit, but at least the Chinese was supposed to be a translation. Um, but from the seventh century, it kind of shows up more and more in um, China and, and on into East Asia. Um, and so as the story goes from the sutra, um, Kitsugarba or Jizo Bosatsu was at one point in one of the many lives um, was a Brahmin um, daughter of an impious mother. Um, and the mother eventually dies. And the daughter is so distraught of thinking about the mother, presumably in the hell realms because of, the mis of her misdeeds, that she feels so stricken by grief of this, this, the mother's suffering that she decides to sell all of her belongings. And as a Brahmin, that might be a considerable amount. Um, and instead then uses that money to, um, to acquisition uh, offerings made to the Buddha each day. So between the offerings and fervent prayer and this demonstration of filial piety and oh, that the mother gains enough merit to come out of the hell realms. In this transmigration, the, the Brahmin daughter comes to see her mother in the hell realm, but also sees all the other beings within the hells and takes it upon herself to make the great vow and help all sentient beings, and therefore taking on the Buddhist path, the Bodhisattva path, and over lifetimes becomes the Bodhisattva Kitsugarba, Jizo Bosatsu. Bosatsu is uh, Japanese for Bodhisattva. So, um, out of this story, a very abridged story, you can go into it if you'd like. It is very detailed. They go into mass description of what the hells entail 
if you feel so inclined. Um, but from the story, the Jizo Bosatsu is considered a purveyor of the six realms of rebirth, particularly the hell realms. And so it, he helps to instruct those going through the samsaric <laughs> rebirth and helps us to transmigrate into the upper levels of rebirth, the six realms of rebirth, hell, uh, the preta realm, uh, meaning the hunger ghost realm, um, animal realm, uh, asuras realm, uh, humans, and divas. So the six lower realms of rebirth. And so um, as an instructor, he helps us and, and guides us along through to better, re better rebirth, through better realms and higher realms of rebirth. Um, and particularly after the Parinirvana of Shakyamuni Buddha, until the, the, the next Buddha to come, Maitreya Bodhisattva. So between this time, he's the one helping um, along this trajectory. He also it comes to represent a, a hope amidst, uh, amongst um, despair, particularly giving people the, the option of finding out, hey, I, there is a way out of hell. Hey, isn't that great? And I say hell, right? We have Jedo Christian connotations about what hell is. Just imagine a really bad existence, okay? Take hell, concept of hell out of it, but just a really bad existence. And so, um, <laughs> If you're in that pit of despair, you can't even fathom a way out. So here is this beacon of light. Jesus comes down and, and helps to facilitate what that person, that being, needs to, to move on to better rebirths. Okay? And this idea becomes really important, in, in my opinion, my opinion, Pat, on that because Jesus becomes very popular, particularly in the 12th, uh, 12th 13th, 14th centuries, um, up until that point, eh, it's kind of, he's kind of there, uh, but not very emphasized. Um, but as we, as we see the advent of, especially in Japan, with the advent of, the, of these new religions, um, all the various iterations of um, um, the schools of Buddhism, um, that come out of Tendai, for example, Jodoshu, Jodoshinshu, Soto, Rinzai Zen, Nichiren, etc. There's this concept of trying to deal with this, this fact of Mako, the age of the degenerate Dharma. So along with other images like Amida, um, Jizo becomes very important to help deal with difficult times. When things are bad, it, it, he's one to help guide pass through these crossroads of how to deal with this degenerate dharma. And so we see his popularity rise greatly during this time. And it continues, and especially in Japan, um, to, to start to um, become now associated with the transitions of life. And so Jizo is often found um, as one of the 13 um, uh, in, uh, figures that are used during memorial services in Japan. So when one dies, a memorial service is done at the time of death, a week later, at various points along this time of between the death of a person and their rebirth. And so um, one of the memorial services would be to Jizo because that is the, the figure at that time that the karmic stream is using as a guide to go on to the next life. So it, they're used, he's used a lot in a lot of... Um, uh, ceremony of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, memorial services and funerary rites. Um, but then also because of that gets expounded into then life's travels um, and not just the changes and um, crossroads that we um, notice during uh, between lives, but in, in, in our own lives. We, we all face difficult paths. We all face crossroads. Jizo is one to help guide along that way, okay? And, and so he, beca he becomes associated with travelers um, as, as many, many saints might be uh, attributed. Uh, we think of St. Anthony when we lose something, right? Um, that is that kind of thing. When, when one is on a pilgrimage, one uses uh, Jizo as a, an image to help get through that difficult path, right? Um, and then, in Japan, it, can, it continues to be important, 
take it or leave because it gains um, uh, an aspect of helping to care for women and children. And, um, and this evolves out of this idea of um, uh, as, as uh, much of what Jizo is used for now in Japan, as you'll often see, and I'll show some depictions of that later, uh, is that is, it becomes more childlike and is really used to help protect children, and especially children, who, the people, the, those who die during, um, uh, or as a child, um, and particularly even those who have died, who haven't been born yet. Um, so we call those musical um, uh, fetuses who have not been born. And so whether that's miscarriage or abortion or things like that. Um, so Jizo is one to help that, that child move on to the next life. And so um, becomes depicted as, as uh, many times as the standing figure here with children around his feet. Kind of, they're all reaching up for his help. You know? um, so, but usually the, the way that he's depicted, and as you see in this picture, this is a very traditional manner, um, at least from a Japanese perspective, but it's usually much, compared to other bodhisattvas, just even other bodhisattvas, much more friendly looking, bald headed as, in, as a monk, no head, elaborate headdress, no ornate robes, much more plain. And, and I, you know, for me and, and others have argued, it, it, it helps elicit a, a, a certain sense of, um, uh, you can approach it much more easily, accessible, yes. right? Accessible. Right. Yeah. accessible. Um, and so there's a level of intimacy and especially for children, you know, and we'll see some of the images later um, and those who, who know um, his image has become um, quite cartoonish for children. So that children aren't scared, you know. <laughs> that's that helps. Um, so, I was just like compared to compared to right. Um, so uh, iconographically, it, he 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 stands apart um, because it, it, it immediately is very different than most other bodhisattva representations. So um, even though he's depicted here uh, in China. He was much more used as one of the guardians of hell, and so one of the ten guardians. So much more um, seen um, at cemeteries, for example, enshrined at cemeteries. Uh, let's go to the next screen. Um, and one of the depictions of, and so in China, it was much more regal. Um, has a crown on the head. Um, the the on the crown you see the six panels. There's three that can be seen, but it goes around the head. Obviously, six again being the six realms. Um, He's, but but here I want to point out immediately, right hand has a staff. This is called a shakuju in Japanese. Um, and in the, the um, left hand is a uh, chintamani. This is the, the wish-fulfilling jewel. Okay. Um, but even here, you know, compared to other Chinese bodhisattvas, um, very distinctive um, and different. And in fact, on, his, on the left-hand side, you can see there's little uh, toba or little placards. Um, in within the cemetery, those would be little nameplates um, for those who have deceased, and so that might be one of many different um, statuary that might be enshrined in that one room. Usually, again, with uh, various other hell guardians, right? Um, and so that would be a Chinese version. And, uh, and whereas then we go to Japan, um, and there's someone else trying to get in. Thank you. Um, whereas in Japan, uh, much more what, what I, I would be much more familiar with, uh, as I might call it, distinguish, distinguish it, um, there is a seated one. I wish Ichima Sensei was here. He, he, would, he, he has um, a Jizo Do at his temple, um, and his is a seated uh, with one leg down. A huge, bigger than life um, size, and, and just very uh, powerful. Um, anyway, but, but usually standing. Now, you can also see here, um, I, I, I put a little bit more ornate to the right-hand side, a little less ornate to the uh, left-hand side. Um, so variations there, but even on that right-hand one, not nearly the elaborate um, uh, festoonness that many are uh, bestowed with. Uh, the Aurora allows for a certain amount of uh, decoration. You can see some gilding on his robes, but really um, much more plain. Um, and so uh, 
the the staff again in his right hand. That is a um, an armament on the top of the staff. That's actually a stupa. If you if you zoom in close, you can see there's like a, a right at the top. There's like a little stone stupa. It's not actually stone, but it's the depiction thereof. And then the three rings on each end of it, which makes six. And again, six paramitas, six rounds, uh, various six things. But as you as he walks, it's it's as it taps the ground, it makes a jangling sound. And as that jangling sound, it disperses the evils mm -hmm. and the demons, clearing the path before them. And in fact, um, those who have done uh, Kaipokyo, they walk with a similar type of staff. And in fact, it is used to like, if there's a snake along the path, like mm -hmm. you gotta use the stick to get rid of the snake so that you can pass. It's so very practical in its toolness. Um, but then in, in the left, that again, that, that wish fulfilling jewel, helping, helping those in the hell realms, give them the wish fulfillment that allows them to see outside of that hell realm, past their dukkha to at least allow for the fact that something might be better beyond and how to make that change going forward, how to follow that path. So uh, uh, all these symbols as a way to kind of allow for someone to invoke a certain mentality around what is it that Jizo is providing us, okay? Um, and, and really, uh, and again, I should say that, um, as you see at the bottom there, that this image continues to evolve, and we'll go to the next slide, to, to represent quite a gamut. Um, so um, I said there, there didn't mention any Tibetan forms, but there on the left and upper middle um, are two Tibetan forms. Um, thank you, Shingaku, for the picture on the left. That is, um, she took that picture um, at a museum. This is of a, um, I, I would probably label it a garba, um, but usually in Tibet, not, there's very little statuary. Um, he's usually drawn or put on tongas like this. Um, the one up in the upper middle is um, probably a much more modern version of that Tibetan form. Um, but they are again holding the chitamani in his hand, holding that wish fulfilling jewel, and then providing the a ground the grounding mudra with his left. So oftentimes you see, and there's actually put over here. Uh, there's the receiving in the left of the right hand, and receiving that dukkha and grounding out that dukkha down the left hand. So this is often a, a seen mudra um, of many that it, it's used as a way to uh, illustrate that kind of grounding out or dispelling of one's dukkha um, after, the transform after its transformation. Then the bottom right guy, he's just fun. Uh, he, it's, it's a Chinese representation, very modern, but still like <laughs> really ripped. Um, but uh, I, I liked it. it. It stirred something. It was like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting representation. But um, and and I say Chinese because uh, he's sitting on a cat, a mythical cat, and in China, um, uh, one of his companions is said to be this mythical cat. Um, but the other three, I kind of wanted to point out as as a kind of Japanese representation of that childlike transformation that Jizo now takes on. I'm often seen with the red bib, the red hat. Um, and, and or seen in these plethora, um, these fields of Jizo statues. Um, and unfortunately, that, that it, it is. It's a, it's a picture of a cemetery. Um, and, and so uh, when and if a family has lost a child, they may buy a statue like this and use it as a way to help the, the merit of the child to you know, uh, have a, a prosperous rebirth. But also, frankly, yeah, helps the family with their own sense of mourning. Um, yeah. And yeah, I was just going to mention, too, like, uh, during COVID, there have been a lot of Jesus statues that people have put, like the put the, the masks on. on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's right. It, it, you know, um, there's it, it, it's the hats and bibs are used as a way to help the 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 sangha member feel like they can dress and and help Jizo do what Jizo needs to do for their child, for example. You know, um, children are encouraged to help Jizo stay warm, right? It's that kind of, that kind of, it kind of imagery. Um, and so this, you might see um, uh, that, that the image itself has been varied, but the figure itself has stayed the same. The meaning behind the figure itself has stayed the same. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. So I just wanted to show some of those just as a, as a, 
weird reference point. Oh, well, and I should say, and then this is the Sanskrit Bija for Jizo. And um, uh, it's ha, ha. And, um, and, and this, can, this can often be a, a representation and, and is often enshrined as such, as a Hanzon. It can be, the Bija can be used as such. Um, and so what I really wanna to get to here by talking a lot about all this is that um, if we can start to look at the story and its various representations um, and start to understand some of the archetypes of what Jizo is, um, they're all ways of kind of coming to know Jizo better. You know, or any given image, any given figure, any given Buddha, Bodhisattva. If we dive into some of the underpinnings, then the image can make a bit more sense, hopefully. <laughs> um, and, and so, because otherwise, you, when you look at it, you're, oh, that's a nice statue. <laughs> You know, oh, that's a that's a nice picture. You know, like, but if you under oh oh he's using he's doing that mudra, oh he's got his staff, oh that that invokes something, it evokes something, and you know, oh uh, when when you see an image of Fudo Myo, yeah, you kind of say oh oh he's not messing around. I'm like okay, he's yeah, oh, I don't want to mess it. But you see Jesus goes up to him, oh, okay, hey man, yeah, I like I like going to him. He's all right, you know. So just by the representation, you get a certain idea, you know, and the more you can learn about the symbology, the more you can kind of become aware and, and imbue some of the, uh, that, those qualities as well. So when we get to, when we understand the mudras, the implements, what we're seated on, how they are positioned, these are just mechanisms that have been put in place Thousands of, a couple thousand years ago, as a way to at least tell a story without words. You know, it, it's it's a and and these symbols have kind of, I mean, we've done symbology for thousands of years. You know, this is just another iteration thereof. And so, you know, it, whether you you may not like the idea of like oh praying to some guy, well, nah, no, take the guyness out of it. I mean, in fact, all, all Buddhists should be kind of genderless, you know? Um, and so it, it's more of the, the quality that they invoke. And we can only know what that quality is if we kind of explore what it is. Excuse me. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you so much. Um, and so um, what I'm getting at is if we want to tap into the things that help, for example, if I'm at a crossroad, do I go this way or that way? Do I make this choice or that choice? If I want to tap into that sense of Jizo-ness, I might want to spend some time with Jizo or other things that represent helping decide through to what is better and surrounding myself with those things. If it's not an image of Jizo, okay, well, I hope it's something else. Again, a couple months ago, we talked about the Medicine Buddha. What does health mean? What does healing mean? What does medicine mean? If you want to heal, surround your stink, surround yourself with symbol, symbols of health. One of them could be Yashinodai, for example. You know, uh, you know, when I think of like, oh, well, we, we've used these, you know, like, oh, but these mudras, like, we have no context for them. True. But um, you, you know, I, I use the analogy of people ask me like, oh, you're an acupuncturist. Does that really work? <laughs> and other than trying to not to take offense from it, um, uh, you know, I think about, I, I say, if, if it didn't work, would it have lasted this long? You know, if, it, if a medical paradigm doesn't help someone, <laughs> it ain't going to survive. I, I kind of feel the same way about a lot of this. If it's not the image of, of Jizo that turns you, turns you on, maybe the, the Bisha will. Maybe it's mantra will. Maybe the, you know, copying the sutra might. All of them tap into that same quality. It's just another way. The symbology may not make sense to you, but if you learn about it, it might. 
So rather than um, rather than trying to look at hey, person up there on the altar, come help me. <laughs> it's, it's much more, huh, I wonder, I wonder if that, I, I see what Jesus is trying to evoke. Can I invoke that in myself? It may, it may be from an inside out. And it may, it may be from a, hey, Jesus, come help me. Neither are wrong. You know, this is, this is jiriki tariki. Tiriki comes from me. Tariki comes from an outside. Help. But inside, outside are not dualistic. They're, 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 it's one in the, so if you want to immerse yourself in that vibe, sorry, new age weirdness, but that energy, right? That sentiment, that quality, you have to, you have to invoke it. And so what I would hope is that for talking about a lot of the, the symbology, the iconography, um, it helps to paint a picture. In the same way that Jackson Pollock, whether you have your opinions about Jackson Pollock, the way he throws that paint it implies an emotion. We can interpret that emotion differently, but it still has a certain gravitas. And, and I would imagine that yeah, and I, I, I'm not an artist, and my father could maybe speak to this, but I would almost say that even being in, in person, I showed you pictures of these statues. If you're in person with the statue, now you're not only experiencing the statue and what it looks like, but what the artist put into that statue. Because most of the time, the artist, as the sculpting, they might be reciting the mantra. They might have done a series of Jizo practices up until that point of when they made the, the, the statue or image or what have you. And they've poured that into it. That has an impact. In the same way that, the, that this, this bija or the image of Jizo, the, those symbols have been poured into by billions of people over hundreds of years. There's something behind that. <laughs> and and that's, not, that's just Jizo, right? We, we, like, we haven't talked about Avakishabara. Man, the number of iterations and depictions and sentiments, but it's outside of words. Get past the words. What does it feel like? That, that's what I want to like. And you can only do it if, you, if you, have to, you have to wrestle with it. You have to dive into it. You have to learn about it. You have to experience it. Experience it. How do you experience it? You have to suspend disbelief. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, oh, that guy doesn't do anything for me. You're right, because it's not a guy. It's just, it, it's a kernel of that Buddha nature. Jizo is an emanation of Dainichi Nyorai. All Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are emanations of Dainichi. Dainichi Nyorai is that Buddha nature, that root. Buddha. So all these other, all these emanations of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are qualities that we can imbue to help it shine. But unless we are getting in touch with that, we, uh, we have no sense. Uh, it's just a statue. It's just an image. And I can tell you, oh, go, you, know, you have trouble with a decision? Go to, go to Jesus Bosas. And that's a belief. They're like, okay, I'll, I'll suspend my disbelief. I'll believe in you and, and pray to Jizo. And maybe if it helps and you get experience, now that there's the development of faith. The faith is the experiential that happens when it helps. And maybe it doesn't. That's okay. But as we develop the faith, now we can go back and we trust and have confidence in. When we trust and have confidence, we let go. And we let that come out without having to uh, do our own selves. <laughs> right? Get in our own way. So rather than thinking about praying to images, praying, praying to these figures, pray to a quality. 
right to the, that Buddha nature, that seed of enlightenment that, that helps us to become better people. You know, so Jesus is just one way, right? Um, my gosh, I could go on and on. <laughs> um, but without, uh, I, will, I, will, I will pause here. I mean, let it be said, uh, obviously, again, I feel very strongly about Jizo. I, I, I have strong connections to him. Um, Gojun Tarada, uh, I visited his temple. That's why I also wanted to include his, the picture of his temple. Um, I went to visit, and I, I mentioned casually in a conversation with his dad that um, he, uh, that I, I really liked Jizo as an image and, and what that meant. And we keep going on, we walk around, and all of a sudden we come back around and he's handing me an image of Jizo. Right. And honestly, I look, looked at it. I'm like, oh, my God, that's amazing. That's so nice. I look and it's like it might as well have been like a dowel of wood. Like it was very cylindrical, like no ornamental robes, just like very basic, no nuance, just simplistic sculptural design. And it was just so moving to me. And and I remember I turned it over and there's that bija on, the, on its bottom. And so oh, the eyes been open and it's been and and that generosity had an impression on me. And so of course, now having had that image on my altar for the last 15, 20 years, it means that much more. And so again, I, you know, I think I'm a little biased, <laughs> but this could be any image. I guess that's my point. This is just one. This is, but it can be any figure. Any representation, but because now I carry that that impression of not only was it the first one that I came in touch with, and it's like, oh, he's relatable. I just shaved my head. Yeah, I'm becoming this monk thing. That's interesting. Oh, he looks like that. Like, yeah, I like this guy because he wasn't like the standoffish, gilded in gold headdress of amazing. You know, like, oh yeah, he's approachable. And now I have received this this wonderful uh, statue. I'm praying to him every day. That, like that meaning grows. So I relate to him more, you know? And, and again, I, I think that that's, that's what I would hope out of all this. It, it, he, he, he's an access point into something deeper. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll pause here. Yeah. Next slide. Let's, uh, let's go into um, questions, comments, thoughts. Um, this is another as if you can tell, that's Jizo there. Um, but again, uh, along these pilgrimage paths, um, helping travelers along their way. But again, we'll open it up to questions, thoughts, comments, please. Well, I think that it's interesting that you, um, aside from your relationship with this, Jizo is interesting because something something I think our society needs right now. But another question I was thinking about, Amalekitsvara is my hero and my personal. And it's interesting because she has become a she in many contexts, but in some she was still a he. And I was curious how Jizo turned into a, a, a guy. And can she be brought back? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, again, I try to take gender out of this. It is really hard because, again, there it is. Is it's an, it's an image. Now, what I would because uh, I'm going to argue my own point here. We want to relate to the quality, and to make it relatable, you it, people at that time made it a person, and unfortunately, the people making them at that time were probably guys and probably four monks more than nuns. Again, just numbers. I know that there are female, female sculptors, female artists, and female nuns. Nuns, female nuns, monks. But generally speaking, when these depictions were carried out, the quality took on a... Gender within a patriarchy. I mean, it, it's unfortunate, but it's also, I mean, it, it's what helped 
the monks at the time relate to the image. I, you know, that's just my answer. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, you know, because again, I might suggest that you could use your own symbology to create whatever, you know. Um, so I try to put it into that historical context. Um, and, and in fact, there have been other, like, I can't say female figures of Jizo, but much more effeminate. I can maybe draw that line. You're gay. Well, I mean, so, I mean, maybe, you know, like, I mean, actually, you're not out of the closet, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, but, it, it, and so, Abu Kishavara can on it only because compassion is more, more feminine. That's why she tends to be. No, but we, we we've also this, seen this. This one suggests that she became. He also became a protector of sure. children, and I mean, it has a lot of associations for females. That's right. In terms of compassion. That's right. Yeah, and 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 so why? That's hard. You know, like that would be that would be presumptuous of me. I don't expect but, an answer, but I just yeah yeah I know it, it, it is curious. well. And, and my father brought up earlier. He wrote me an email like, what? so this girl all of a sudden was just like this this male bodhisattva, and it's like, well, lifetimes, right? We're all both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sorry. there's so many uh, all the sculptures of of the Kizushvara that start as a male and become a female, or vice versa, or you know, whatever. And there's the also the stories of, for example, the dragon. King's daughter, daughter yeah. who, uh, yeah. you know, that you have to be yeah. a male, a bodhisattva. Yeah. Yeah. So back there, yeah. back then. And, that, and I try to, I like, at, at least in the story, it's not like all of a sudden the, the Brahmin girl made the, the, the bodhisattva vow and all of a sudden became, you know, Kitsugarva bodhisattva, right? There, there, it was a, along the trajectory, mm -hmm. right? Um, on their way to um, uh, bodhisattva-ness. Um, but yeah, that is that is perpetually. I, I think, I think again, it's one of those. What does the quality represent? What is the depiction? And 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 so, if it if it is more gentle to depict as a woman, yeah, yeah, she should be depicted as a woman. Nothing wrong with that. Um, it looks like Shoshi, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if you or anyone there remembers the. Um, the Jizo mantra, I, I, I may have learned it one time, but I can't remember it. But um, in, in Japanese, it's on ka ka kabisamae sawaka, ka bi samaye sawaka. In, in Sanskrit, on ha 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 vima samaye samaye swaha, on ha 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 vimae swaha. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that, that's bija syllable, that bija syllable, ka, 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 or ha, ha, ha. Ka, ka, ka is the um, transliteration into, into Japanese. Um, in Sanskrit, it's ha. Um, okay, yeah. and what was that, what was that bija again? What, I'm sorry, I didn't get it fast enough. You, you can, uh, can you go back to that slide? Or, uh, uh, it's just, uh, I got the bija, I just want to know okay. what it's called. Ha, H-A. Ha, that's ha. Oh, okay. Th um, thank you, Koshin. This was an excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah David. Um, I'm, you were breaking up a little bit, so you may have covered this, but uh, one of the other places you'll find uh, statues of Jizu in the Japan is in fire stations and rescue units because he is sort of a patron of them. After all, what's more inspiring than someone who leaves the comfort of a Buddha realm of, of you know, finally leaving this real existence to come back and at least in theory, go down into the flames of hell to retrieve someone. That's right. So he becomes very much a um, symbol for the firefighters there. That's right, that's right. It, it, it's, it's so interesting to me how that evolves because again it's the same it's the same imagery it's the same idea right crossing through fiery pits of hell to and, and so yeah firemen <laughs> you know um and in and, and, and the same in the same respect of how he's depicted for um um for children i should have had a bit more of those pictures for um 
for children and, or of those in uh, at cemeteries, um, very cartoon like, and and because it's again, it, it's it's what the the viewer, what the perceiver needs to, or what the artist wants the perceiver to to feel when they see the image. Now we didn't even talk about all the folk stories that are tied around Jiso to reinforce the archetype, right? So now there are not only the stories when you see the image that are brought up, but then this whole entire sentiment of what it means to be the, this protector of children, you know? And so, um, uh, Shingaku, are you there? Yeah, can you, can you tell us the story um, that you told me earlier, please? The one that I mentioned about my friend? Um, uh, that one and, and the, and the uh, television. Sort of the, ah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we were talking earlier about how prevalent Jizo is in Japan, and my latest Netflix show that I'm obsessed with is called um, Old Enough, which is about these uh, like three to five year old Japanese kids who go on their first errand. And uh, the third episode of it, there's a girl who goes out and she has to go get a cabbage from the field and deliver something to a neighbor. But along the way, one of her parts of her journey is to put a hat on the Jizo statue. And it, <laughs> uh, it shows the, um, her mom sits with her, they're reading a book about Jizo. And throughout this whole um, adventure, you know, she stops with this joyful expression, puts the hat on Jizo, and really um, they kind of emphasize in that episode how she feels protected by Jizo. At the end, the mom says, oh, were you scared? And she says, no, there was a light, which was the, um, the light from actually the camera people who were following her all along. But the, you know, the narrator says, well, it was the light of Jizo who was protecting her. Um, so I just think there's this magic that uh, that's part of um, seeing Jizo everywhere. And to get back to what Koshin, you said earlier, this idea of um, letting go a little bit, that balance of self-power and other power requires us to just um, be open to some of the magic that's there in the world. And, and I think what I would also point out is that for the Japanese public, looking at that image of the girl putting on the hat, elicits a whole wealth of emotion for the, for the person seeing that. Because now there's not just the cultural, there's the cultural context, but also, oh, this, here's this girl learning, learning about it and what does that mean as she grows and things. So there's this whole kind of wealth of emotion tied behind the simple act, right? But because there's a cultural context for it. And so again, the image of Jizo is varied, but it's evolved because the, what, it, it, what the, the figure is trying to invoke in its new perceivers. You know, meaning still the same. Thank you, thank you, Shinkaku. Mm. <sighs> Any? I see Shoshin yeah. and Jake. Uh, oh, Shoshin, Jake, uh, Jake. Chodan and then Jake. Uh, Shoshin, do you have a follow up or you just still have your hand up? Or? I just wanted to say that quickly that years ago, um, many of us in the Sangha uh, helped the. Um, the Oregon, I forget the name of the song in Oregon. It's the famous one. Anyway, we made um, patches uh, that were ultimately going to be sewn into a quilt in Japan. And we had to draw, the, they were trying to um, get as many uh, illustrations of Jizo as possible to celebrate the I think it was the the 50th or 60th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and they made these put these quilts together you know we just sent squares that had to be of a certain size and we all had to draw up just pictures with as many Jesus in the pictures and and put down the number and um send it in and it uh we saw pic many pictures of the you know 
they must have had hundreds of quilts all together that they uh, received in Japan. And they, I think they sent them around to um, different agencies in Japan for that anniversary. So we all, we had a great time uh, making those, those squares. It was, it was a lot of fun. So I guess that would come down to sort of like uh, copying the suture in a certain way. <laughs> It was well, fun. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. It, the ma magic juju blanket. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I was going to say, anyone who's in uh, traveling distance of uh, Manhattan at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, there is a magnificent, larger than life size statue of Rizzo with a uh, um, yes, and, uh, yeah. all the Shaku Joe. Yes, I know you. Beautiful statue, mm -hmm. very different than simple, plain, monkish style. Mm -hmm. This is a fully, fully real statue. Mm -hmm. Is it on permanent display? Yeah, it's on okay. permanent mm -hmm. display in the, in the Asia Gallery. Asia Gallery, okay. Thank you. Uh, and Jake? Yes. We'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, I would like to share some of my personal testimony with Jizo Bodhisattva Mahasattva, uh, particularly because I was very inspired. I'm very happy by the fact that you mentioned feeling, because I think that's such an important part of the spiritual journey. And the image that you can see behind me is actually from uh, in my room, in the corner of my room, I have a Jizo Bodhisattva Mahasattva statue. And uh, when I went to order it, uh, I got it from... So, so somebody on Etsy and uh, one of the things that I learned from my spiritual journey is any time that I try to get a spiritual tool or a statue or whatever it might be and I'm looking for one I look and I try to see the one that evokes the strongest feeling and so when I look for one I always if it's if it's one of the, if it's something that I have to think about then I decide you know what that's not the one so I was going through and I was looking for different statues and this uh, particular statue, right when I saw it, I'm like, this is the one. And it came all the way from Indonesia. And, uh, you know, the this moment that it showed up for the first few days in my room, I swear it felt different to me in my room from the moment that I opened up the box uh, and, t you know, took him, took him out of the box. Uh, it felt different. And I mean, I'm it. I, when I say felt different, I mean like a very strong feeling. I'm actually kind of getting the feeling a little bit now as I'm saying this. It's <laughs> that's it, that's <laughs> but 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 this but it's you know I'm talking a very strong feeling. You know, kind of with the same kind of strength that you would maybe feel at a funeral or a wedding or something like that. That strong. So that that I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Glenn. Is that you with your hand up? And then we'll then we'll wrap up. I would I would say I think I I, I experienced something similar like um, instead of just uh, a, a statue of Jizo, um, I actually like uh, one what what so I, like in, about like a couple of years ago, I found this lantern, this stone lantern, um, that just somehow for some reason spoke to me. It's like it, it's like a very nice statement. It's a you know it, it's a tradition. It, it's a traditional uh, Japanese stone lantern, but this this style specifically has a uh, jizo uh, engraved into into it, and it it I, it's I, I just felt I felt some kind of connection with that too, mm -hmm. and and then what makes it what makes it like what makes it even you know more interesting is the, is the fact that it's, that it's a lantern, so it's like jizo right. shining uh, his light. You know, for guiding yeah. those from the out of the hell the the hell realms, and it, it's it's yeah. like it's something that really like, spoke to me, and like you know, I, I just like I just couldn't uh, resist it. I just say I I need it. <laughs> I need it for my. I can yeah. I can say no to this. I just need this for my garden, <laughs> and I did. I I I, I got it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, yeah. Good. Thanks, Glenn. Um, and thank you, everyone. Um, at this point, we'll head on out. Um, and folks staying here, uh, Kaiden will will guide you on to bliss and on your top off some right? <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Kaiden. That'd be great. <laughs> nice to see you, everybody. So um, I was really glad that
Koshin talked about Jizo Bodhisattva tonight. Because I think one of the more interesting things about Buddhism is, and that's maybe unfamiliar to a lot of us who didn't necessarily grow up as Buddhists or in a country where uh, Buddhist iconography sort of surrounds us, is sort of interesting to hear the stories, right? And to sort of learn why the icons look the way they do, what they represent. And personally, you know, we really relate to stories very well. It's something that even if you don't think that you're a storyteller, everybody is naturally a storyteller. For instance, uh, when you ask somebody what they did yesterday, the first thing you do is start telling a story. Now, somebody's calling on the phone. One moment. Excuse me. But the second you begin to answer a question, like what you did yesterday, you immediately start telling a story. And interestingly enough, we're constantly surrounded by stories. And storytelling is actually the central, something that's central to Buddhism, both. Uh, huh, they seem to be calling back. Um, something that's central to Buddhism. Apologies, let's try this a third time. The storytelling, though, is something that's both, uh, both sort of positive and negative in Buddhism, right? Because if we look to somebody like Nagarjuna or the, the historical Buddha himself, in many ways, storytelling is the source of suffering, right? The quote that we used from the Pashna is actually about that, right? That the people begin to treat the sort of causal chain of events as something that's, that's really real that they can't escape from. And you start to interpolate, interpolate yourself into that story. And pretty soon you find yourself in the same situation as the people who are in the hell realms, right? That Jesus is trying to, trying to help, trying to remind them that there's somewhere else they can go. But they've forgotten that possibility. And uh, in, that, in that same quote that we used from the Vipassana, it ends with uh, lost in projections. They become captives of the actors and actions of their own minds which I love that phrase because at first we try to understand a situation, we tell a story about it, and then we become part of that story. And pretty soon the story is real. And the story is the way it always was, right? That's the way that we see the situation now. But we start to get dragged around by the story that we've told. You know, you get defensive if somebody else remembers the event differently because you were there, you know exactly how it happened. And this becomes sort of a, a push point of, of dukkha, right? This makes our life more difficult than it needs to be. Interestingly enough, uh, Aristotle actually wrote in the Poetics about storytelling from a couple of different perspectives. And one of those was sort of the way that we often think about a story of being a narrative, right? And he identified a narrative arc where in general, a story starts with a sort of protagonist who is in a position of good fortune. Everything's going great. And then through the course of the story, that person falls into some sort of misfortune. And that's, that's sort of what draws us into the story, right? We want to know how the person gets there. And it's something that we can relate to. It always feels like things were going great right before whatever the new thing is. But he also paired that with the journey from fortune to misfortune is also the journey from ignorance to knowledge. The person becomes less fortunate over the course of the story. But the reason we follow the story is because of what they gain, right? The new understanding, the lesson that we learn from it. Now, interestingly enough, this isn't just something that we see on television or in novel or something like that. This is how all the stories go. This is how you talk about what happened yesterday, but this is also how we talk about history. This is also how we tell stories about what happens in politics or how we understand international affairs. And more and more, if you look for it, you'll see that, you'll see that narrative. Storytelling is taking the things that happen in the world that aren't necessarily connected or seem very connected and trying to put them into some sort of little universe that you can understand. And you get rid of the parts of the story that are sort of difficult to bring into that picture. And then you have the little toy world where it's easy to understand what's happening because the world's huge and it's really hard to understand all of the things that are at play in any situation. And in fact, this is what the teaching of Ichinen Sanzen is about, right? Is that inconceivability of just being in the world. 
but it's necessary to understand things. So we put them in a the little rational framework and we come up with a story that fits the set of what we see as the facts the best that we can. Now, sometimes <laughs> this is a detriment and sometimes this is useful. Interestingly enough, aside from this idea of telling like a story of somebody going over this arc from fortune to misfortune and gaining knowledge from ignorance along the way, another form of storytelling that Aristotle talked about was poetry. And what he saw as different about poetry is that poetry didn't need to fit in a necessarily rational framework because poetry was not about a series of events that are causally connected. It's about the potential that exists in a given moment. Now, the reason I bring this up is because that's exactly the realm that bodhisattvas like Jizo Bodhisattva represent, right? Jizo Bodhisattva allows us to take the natural inclination that we have as human beings to try and fit things into a little toy universe that we can understand and tell a story about them and be able to see the clear arc, right? We can see fortune and misfortune come and go. We can see the journey from ignorance to knowledge. But we get trapped in those things and we begin to lose that might, right? The poetry part of it, the potential that's, that's latent in that situation. And it would be okay if we always understood that we were telling stories, but we really don't. Just like that quote from the Lankavatara Sutra, we start to be drug around by the stories that we tell ourselves. And pretty soon, it's hard to remember where the story started. That's just the universe that we live in. One of the reasons that we have all of these figures is because your greatest weakness is often also your greatest strength. And this is when we're looking at the situation of telling a story, getting lost in it. The fact that we can do that actually allows us to get out of that trap if we can tell a different story. Now you can't just like go off into like totally wild making things up where you can't, can't live in the world <laughs> anymore. Like that's just not gonna be productive. But you can use your natural inclination to tell yourself a story to think about what parts of the story could be different based on what you're perceiving and what's happening. For many people, you can look toward a bodhisattva like Jizo. Jesus is going to be there to help no matter what's going on. Well, you can see that as a metaphor or a symbol or a magical ray of light that comes down from the sky and changes your circumstances. But the reality is that the reason we need these celestial bodhisattvas is to shock us out of the stories that we keep telling ourselves, to be able to see the potential that's hidden in them. That's not our normal way of thinking. Now that that can take on any form that you really want it to. That's part of the magic of looking for the potential that's hidden in the story that you tell yourself. I think for me, one of the most interesting things in Buddhism is learning about all of these, all of these sort of figures and sometimes hearing stories from history about how a certain person believes that that figure interceded for them. And I remember one of my favorite stories that uh, a friend back in Oklahoma told me, which um, she had been in a car accident. And she always paid respect to Avalokiteshvara, Kanan Bodhisattva, because she was convinced that the particular way that her car was hit, because she was still hit, she was still in the car wreck, she was T-boned she had very minor injuries and she was convinced that that was because she had always felt that affinity toward Kanan Bodhisattva. Whether that's true or not, doesn't really matter. What matters is that every time that she was in trouble or she saw somebody else in trouble, she would come back to that story and she would try and help them see that there was a lot of the situation that could be very different than how it was playing out. And that's kind of the trick, right? Is to break out of those habitual ways of thinking and to be able to see where there is some sort of hidden potential in the situation. So just taking a quote um, 
tragic characters pass from fortune to misfortune, not as a result of some divine curse, but because their actions produce effects that are the reverse of those expected. And in suffering these effects, they attain knowledge of what they did not know. Svaha.